Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Hello and welcome to our Sunday evening video Bible study. It's September the 12th, 2021. I am thankful to have been given the privilege to assemble with fellow Christians this morning to worship God. And I hope that you were afforded that same privilege. I'm also thankful to get to spend some time via video in a period of Bible study right now. I'm Mark Howell, and I serve as the preacher for the Midway Church of Christ. And so, with your Bible in hand, let's all be ready to open it and search the Scriptures together. Now, we've been talking about a tool called prayer. It's been our focus over the past several weeks. We're talking about prayer as it relates to new Christians and learning about prayer as well. Now, last week, we explored four kinds of prayers that we find mentioned in the Scriptures. We talked about supplications. Supplications are simply a humble, earnest request for God to meet some need, whether it's for me or for someone else. We also talked about the word prayers. Now, this word is a more generic term that includes more than just asking God for something. It could be us giving praise to God in our words that we speak to Him or a number of other things. Thirdly, we talked about intercessions. Intercessions is to speak to God on behalf of someone else. And then number four, we talked about thanksgivings. You know, we spend a whole lot of time asking God for things, but we must also remember to spend some time thanking Him for them as well. Now, these four things can be included in a single prayer, or they may each be a separate prayer, but they're all different kinds of prayers. But we also said that there is some overlapping in some of these four kinds of prayers. And so we don't have to make uh, as much distinction sometimes as we might think in our own mind. Let's go back to the Bible and study about prayer again tonight. There's an interesting passage found in the book of Luke. It goes like this, Luke chapter 11 at verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. I want you to hold that in your mind, but while you're doing that, I want you to listen to some humorous children's prayers that have been prayed. Here's the first one. Dear God, I want to be just like my daddy when I grow up, but without so much hair all over. Here's another one. Dear God, when my mom makes leftovers, do I have to pray for the food again? Here's another one. Dear God, I say your prayer every night. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us some email. But I never get an email from you. Do you have my right email address? Now, these are funny little prayers from some honest hearts, but they are indicators that as we grow, we need to learn more about prayer and more about how to pray. Jesus didn't rebuke his disciples for asking him to teach them how to pray. He didn't tell them, well, you should have known that. You, you grew up, you know, and you should have learned as you were growing up. But rather, Jesus responded in a positive way to the requests that they made. Again, going back to the book of Luke chapter 11, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, And he said to them, When you pray, say. And he's about to tell them some things that they should say. And in the book of Matthew chapter 6 at verse number 9, we have Matthew's account of, of what is said. And in Matthew 6 verse 9, Matthew records, Pray then like this. Jesus taught his disciples and us how and for what we should pray. And so we want to spend some time looking at those things and digging deeper into them so that we'll understand more about our own prayer life. Number one, Jesus taught us to pray to our Father. Now here's what Jesus said again. Remember verse 2, Luke chapter 11 at verse 2? And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father. But not just any father. 
not our physical father and certainly not a pope or a priest somewhere. In the book of Matthew, in his account, we have Matthew explaining what Jesus means because he records the words of Jesus as this. He said, pray then like this, our Father in heaven. And so it's not just some father or any father, it's our Father in heaven. The fatherhood of God should be an important piece of our faith. The Bible addresses the fatherhood of God numerous times, even in the Old Testament. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3, at verse number 19, the Bible said, I said, How I would set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, a heritage most beautiful of all nations. And I thought you would call me my father and not turn from following me. Uh, In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, at verse number 16, Jesus said in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45, the Bible says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. In Matthew chapter 6 at verse 1, Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And in Matthew chapter 23 at verse 9, the Bible says, And call no man your Father on earth, for you have one Father who is in heaven. What Jesus is doing is he is teaching us about our spiritual relationship with God. When when Jesus said, pray, our Father who is in heaven, he's telling us to remember the spiritual relationship that we have with God. As we pray, there's something for us to keep in mind. Uh, Do you remember when we were talking several weeks ago now? about a man by the name of Nicodemus who came to Jesus. The Bible says it was this man who came to him by night. And when we were talking about Jesus, we noted in the book of John chapter 3, both at verse 3 and verse number 5 in that chapter, that Jesus indicates to Nicodemus that you must be born again. Now, that's done by being born of water according to that passage the water indicating the baptism that we are to go through. It's done by being born of the Spirit, as we also noted. We don't have time in this lesson to go back and deal with those things. But simply remember that when we become Christians, we experience the new birth. We're baptized into the family of God. In the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, Paul writes and says, For in Christ Jesus... You are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Again, through this new birth, we enter the family of God. We enter into the church. Remember again what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 3 at verse number 15. Paul said, If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Now, we studied about this verse again earlier in our studies, but as we did that, we noted that the idea, the term household, refers to the family of a person, and in this case, the family of God, the household of God. But Paul goes on in this passage to identify who that household consists of. He said, how you ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. God. And so, as we become members of the church, members of the body of Christ, we become a member of the family of God, and we can pray to our Father who is in heaven. Now, remembering that relationship, there's an interesting statement that Jesus makes in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. There the Bible says, "...if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children..." How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? And so as we pray to God and we pray our Father who is in heaven, we have that relationship, we're reminded of that, but we also should be reminded in that relationship that it's God who wants to bless us. 
It's God who wants us to have the good things that He has to offer. We're not talking to someone who has no kinship to us. We have, we're not talking to someone who has no, uh, no thought for us, but we're talking to our Father in heaven. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. But then number two, Jesus taught us to pray for God's name to be kept holy. Again, here's what Jesus said going back to the book of Luke chapter 11 at verse 2. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. In Matthew chapter 6 at verse number 9, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What does the word hallowed mean? mean? What, what, if I ask you to define that, how would you define it? Well, that word simply means to separate, to consecrate, or, or we can understand it as to set apart as sacred. And, and it has the thought behind it that we are to feel reverence for or honor whatever it is, the object of it, as holy. To hallow, to regard as holy, to honor as holy. And so we're talking about the name of God. It is to be considered, it's to be separated, set apart. We're to have reverence for the very name of God. We're to honor the very name of God and regard it as holy. Now, when we approach God in prayer, we, we must remember that God is unlike us in every possible way. We can use some big words in regard to that. We can say that God is omnipotent. Now, that simply means that God is all-powerful. We can say that God is omniscient. All that means is that He is all-knowing. And we can say that God is omnipresent. In other words, He's able to be in all places at all times, in all places at the same time. Now, what sense would prayer make if those three things were not true? Why pray to a God who did not have the power to do what we're asking Him to do? Why pray to a God who is unable to be with us at the time and place of our greatest needs when we come to Him? Maybe we're in a hospital room, or maybe we're by a graveside, or, or maybe we're somewhere where we, where we need His help, where we need His loving kindness. If He's not able to be there with us, then what good would it do to pray? What, what do, good would it do to pray to Him if He's not able to be with us when our lives appear in danger from some imminent threat? What good would it do? And, and then not only that, but why well, pray to God whose knowledge is as limited as mine? If God is not omniscient, if He's not all-knowing, why would I want to go to Him in prayer? What good could it possibly do to ask Him to help me understand the things that puzzle my mind and vex my spirit if He has no more knowledge than I have? John Hamby says this. He says, We're saying, May your name be given the unique reverence that is due your character and nature as the Heavenly Father. Elmer Towns says, When you pray, Hallowed be thy name, you climb to a new level of respect for God and reverence for His person. You are ascending to the very heart of God to recognize who He is and what He has done for us. In the Old Testament, one of God's commands, one of His Ten Commands, is found in Exodus chapter 20 at verse number 7. Moses writes this down for us. He said, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, sometimes when we talk about taking the name of God in vain, we limit our thinking to the concept of taking God's name in vain by cursing, or as we say in the South, by cussing. And so, you know, we sort of think about taking the name of God in vain in that way. Well, in reality, the concept is much broader than that. The word translated vain here in this passage means simply empty or worthless. In the book of Job, chapter 7, at verse number 3, 
Job, in talking about the plight that he found himself in, he's lost his family, he's lost his wealth, he's lost his health. And and so he makes a a speech and he says, So I am allotted months of emptiness, and nights of misery are apportioned to me. The word translated emptiness here in Job chapter 7 at verse 3 is the same word that we have in relation to the name of God, taking the name of God in vain. We don't make the name of God empty. Uh, There's more to it than that. In Psalm 119, verse 37, David says, Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. The word translated worthless here in this passage in Psalm 119, verse 37, is the same word translated vain. When to take the name of God in vain, one way that we can do that is to treat it as though it is worthless. Now, flippantly speaking the name of God with phrases like OMG and the like, that'd be included in in counting God's name as worthless, taking it in vain, treating it as though uh, it has uh, emptiness within it. And so, As Christians, I'm calling on you not to do that. But when we fail to recognize who God is and the fact that He's not like us and is far superior to us, we tend to minimize His name. To pray to God with anything other than the utmost respect, the utmost honor, the utmost dignity, is not to count His name as holy as Jesus tells us to do, It's more like taking God's name in vain. And so when Jesus said that we are to say, hallowed be your name, it is to remind us of the power and the wisdom and all of the things that are related to God. Now, the Old Testament reveals many characteristics of God that we should actually think about and and comprehend when it uses the name of God in a, in a number of places in the Old Testament, we see these different characteristics. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar nor the son of one, and so I'm not uh, altogether sure how to pronounce some of these things, but some of them I do know. Uh, there's a word in the Old Testament, Elohim, which refers to God. God is the mighty creator. There's the word Adonai, which means Master and Lord. It's used in the book of Genesis chapter 15 when God is engaged in conversation with Abraham. There's the name El Shaddai, Almighty God. Genesis chapter 17, again, when he is in the presence and talking to Abraham. El Elyon, Most High God. Genesis chapter 14. El Oroi, the strong one that sees, Genesis chapter 16, in regard to Abraham's handmaiden, or I should say Sarah's handmaiden who had borne a son to Abraham, Hagar. El Olam, everlasting God, Genesis 21, verses 22 through 33. Jehovah, the self-existent one, Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, that God reveals to Moses. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, Genesis chapter 22. Jehovah Imkadish, the God who sanctifies, Leviticus chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd, Psalm 23. Jehovah Rophi, the God who heals, Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 26. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace, Judges 6, verses 11 through 24. Jehovah Shema, the Lord is here, Ezekiel chapter 48, verses 30 through 35. Jehovah said, can you, the Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. Now, I didn't say all of these things to get you to remember the names and try to pronounce those Hebrew words. But I said those things in order for us to understand that the name of God is not empty. 
that the name of God is not worthless, that the name of God should not be taken in vain, that the name of God should be counted as holy. Not only that, but additionally, when we pray, hallowed be your name, I want us to understand that it leaves us with a great responsibility. Now, let me illustrate in, in this way. You know, every once in a while, there's a college football player who gets arrested for doing some kind of sinful or criminal activity. Now, does this kind of thing have any effect on the college for which he plays? Well, I think the answer to that is yes, and in a sense, it, it, it does in a certain way give a school a bad name. But, but these players, they may not change the school, but they may have tainted its reputation. If God's children act in ways unbecoming of His family as His children, as His sons and daughters, we give God a bad name. We haven't changed His holy character, but we have defamed His holy name. And so when we pray, hallowed be your name, we're saying, Father, your reputation is at stake in me, and may I live in such a way that, that, that I can be a credit to you and not a detriment. May others see your character through my behavior and honor your name because of what they see about you in me. We need to remember that when we say, hallowed be your name, it's not just that we're saying that God is set apart, but as those who are praying to Him, as His children, the ones who have been given that privilege to pray to Him, our life needs to match up so that we don't bring shame upon His holy name. When Jesus teaches us to pray, He teaches us two main things at the very outset of our prayer. He teaches us to remember to whom you are to pray. In other words, we're to pray to our Father who is in heaven. And not only that, He also teaches us to remember to whom we are praying, and that is the Holy God of heaven. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, the writer says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And then in verse 16, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may, have, uh, may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because of Jesus, we can come boldly into the very throne room of God. We can do that with confidence when we go there. But just because we can go boldly into the throne room of God having confidence, that does not mean that we go with arrogance and pride. It means that we go with humility and reverence for the very name of God. We're going to look more at how Jesus teaches us to pray next week. And I hope that you'll join us then. Would you like a free Bible correspondence course to study more of God's Word from the privacy of your own home? To request your free correspondence course, simply email us. You can email us at BibleStudy at MidwayCofC.com. That's BibleStudy at MidwayCofC.com. Be sure to include your name and mailing address in your email so that we can get uh, the, the correspondence course out to you as quickly as possible. Everyone has an open invitation to be our guest every Sunday. Our worship begins at 9.30. Following our worship, we dismiss into Bible classes designed for all different age groups. And we encourage everyone to stay with us for these so that we can learn as much as we can from the Word of God. Our building is located at 17010 Highway 69 between Jasper and Oakman. Now, we strongly urge everyone to be present at the live assemblies. This is God's plan for us. However, if for some reason you can't attend in person, be sure to use our Sunday worship tool on YouTube. That video tool begins at 9.30 each Sunday morning. And you can find the link to the video by going either to our YouTube or our Facebook page. We also invite you to be a part of our Wednesday evening Bible study here at the building at 6.30 each Wednesday. For those who may be unable to attend in person, you can find a one-week delayed stream of our Wednesday service at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesdays. 
And you can do that by going to either our YouTube page or our Facebook page. Let's close out with a prayer. Holy and righteous Father in heaven, we come before you. We're so thankful, Father, for the greatness of your holy name. And Father, we pray that as we learn more and more about you, that we'll honor and reverence you more and more. And Father, when we pray, help us to always remember who we're praying to. Our Father, but our Father who is so much superior to us. May we never take your name for granted. May we never take it in vain. Father, there are so many for whom we are praying. Those who are sick, those who have COVID, those who have lost loved ones, those who have other issues in their life that they're hurting at this moment. And Father, we know that you know the need of each one. And we pray for them and we pray that you can help them as only you can. And Father, that you'll help us to be there for our brothers and sisters in Christ and for others throughout the world that we might lead them and help them in living for you. Father, continue to be with the congregation here at Midway. Help us to be a shining light to our community. Father, be with our nation as we uh, go through so many things here. We pray that we will uh, have the opportunity to help others see you and that, Heavenly Father, they can have an open heart to hear your will. Watch over us each day. Forgive us when we sin. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah, the glory, revive us again.